Today I'll be reading Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 9. Again, that's Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 9. And it says, Now when he saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are those poor in spirit, for there is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the sons of God. Thank you, Josiah. It's great to see everybody today, even if it is a little bit unusual out, a little bit cold and rainy lately. Uh, God is always good. So you have a chance to have your picture taken today, if you just feel especially beautiful. I know some of you guys feel that way. You look good today, right? So you ought to have your picture taken, and you know, definitely if your family has one of those blue backgrounds that we stopped taking probably six years ago, (laughs) go ahead, admit to your age, and have another photo taken so that it'll fit in with all the rest of them. Uh, And especially if your kids in the photo were this big and are now taller than you, please have another photo taken. Or if your kids have left and they're still in the photo with you, get your kids to take a photo so we know who they are. Uh, We have some who just want to hang on to their youth, I think, and and they think that's a way to do it. That's not working for you. (laughs) Let me just tell you that up front. Uh, One of the things that uh, else is happening is uh, we're trying to work with our uh, preschool. And so Leanne and Gwen are wanting to meet with uh, some of you who are involved in preschool, especially if you have one in preschool. If you're interested in teaching that, they're just going to meet in the back of the auditorium. And then next week, Joshua wants to meet with the preschool parents to talk about TBH and to try and reorganize that a little bit and try and get some more things going with that. So if you'll meet with Joshua, we'll, we'll tell you the room next week. But we want to see if we can't do a little bit more with them now. Uh, One of the things we've been talking about is our theme for the year, sharing the heart of God. And so being able to do that and being able to just talk to people about where we are and about who God is and hopefully to bring them to Christ. And if we share what we know, then, then that's going to be able to say, here's what it looks like in my life. Look at what God could do in your life. And so today, we want to talk about seeing a little bit and what it means to be able to see God because this whole thing starts from us being able to see God first because if we can't see God and we have no clue who God is and we're not really close to him it's not really going to work to share your doubts Uh, so then you're not able to so what does it take in order to see God how do we get to that place and the passage that was read to us this morning the One on the pure in heart, verse 8 says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. That's kind of an odd way of looking at that, isn't it? He's given you a whole bunch of things about who blessed people are, who happy people are, who, what it means to, to feel this blessing from God. And so he talks a little bit about this. And these are the blessed people as those who are humble, those who know how to mourn, the meek, the hunger for righteousness, the merciful, the pure in heart, and the peacemakers. And then they get incredible things from this. They're given the kingdom of heaven. They're given comfort for their sorrow. They inherit the earth. They're going to be satisfied. They get mercy. And they're able to see God and to be his children. What a tremendous thing it is to be in that list and to feel like you're part of that list. Well, we want to look at one of those. The pure in heart are blessed because they are able to see God. And what does that really mean? Does that mean other people don't see God? But then God's not really visible, is he? 
So how do we see God if God's not visible? What does God look like in those cases? Well, you probably know of people, or maybe you yourself, feel really close to God. And you just feel like you know who he is, you want to come to worship, uh, you want to, to be part with God, you feel like he directs your life, like he controls some things in your life, like he is one of those things in your life that, that you depend on more than anything else. And you understand him when he doesn't answer your prayer right away, you understand that, you believe that he will. You believe that he has the best interest in mind, and you see God working in other people. You see God working in the Bible as you read those stories. You see him being able to interact with people, and those stories become real. Those are real people. It's not just like, well, that's some kind of history book for some guy that happened somewhere, and we don't know much about whether it's true or not. You see God in daily situations. They see God in, in their life. They pray to God. They understand God. They feel like he knows and understands them. They feel like he's their protection and their support. And they're walking in his protection and guidance. Well, when you start thinking about that, that's great. There's a lot of times that we have trouble seeing, though. Uh, I have one of those. If I don't have these on... I don't see so well. Uh, I can still tell you're out there. So don't all leave right now. <laughs> it's just you don't have faces anymore. So, <laughs> so I'm going to wear them so I can see things a little bit better now. And uh, that makes a huge difference. But if you've lost your glasses, it's hard to see things sometimes. You try and cheat with contacts so nobody knows you've got on glasses. But... You know, still, you need those to be able to see. Or, you know, this doesn't happen so much here. We've seen a little bit of it here in the last few days. But sometimes the windshield is not exactly clear. I can remember being up north and you get out your comb, you go out and the windshield is completely frosted over. You take the back of your comb because you forgot the ice scraper and you scrape out a little bitty hole in the front there. And then you get in the car and turn the defroster on full blast, and you hope it thaws by the time you hit traffic. But you're driving through this little tiny hole in the windshield to be able to see where you're going to go. Not exactly recommended. I don't know if there's less accidents in Arizona in the morning or not, but certainly visibility is a lot better unless you get the, the dew or the fog or something like that. And so sometimes we're restricted with what we can see because of other things in our life either because our vision isn't good and we don't have our glasses on or because there's other stuff going on and I think that's where we run into our biggest problem in being able to see God is there's other stuff going on in our life that limits what we're able to see and so I think that's an important thing for us to realize some people don't see God they feel like he's miles away they think they're all alone they think God isn't going to help. Even if they prayed, he wouldn't do anything for them. It wouldn't happen. No one cares that it's not going to get any better. The world is a terrible place, and there's basically no hope. It's pretty depressing, isn't it? If there was a God, he would fix it. But obviously, the world is in such bad shape, the reason for that is nobody cares, nobody's doing anything about it, and certainly that can't be a God who would allow those things to happen. And so we make judgments about God. I think it's only certain people who are able to see God. And I think, does it come from God not showing up? He shows up for some people, he doesn't show up for other people? Probably not. It has to do with where we are and what we're able to see and what we allow ourselves to see. In 1961, the first man went into space. He was a cosmonaut. Most of you may not remember that far back, but his first statement was this, I don't see any God up here. Were we surprised that he said that? He's from Russia. They don't believe in God. We weren't shocked at all. 
We never expected him to see God. Why not? Because he didn't grow up with God. They don't believe in God. The country isn't about God. There's, there's some people there now, but back at that time, it was completely outlawed to be any part of religion. And so I don't know that we were really surprised. He wasn't in a position to see God. The people around him, the friends that he had, his upbringing, it didn't let him see God. And so maybe you can understand a little bit of how we're limited in what we're able to see because we didn't grow up with that. And if you grew up in a family that was far away from God and didn't think God was real and didn't believe in God and you never came to Bible class and you never saw any part of, of what religion was about or, or studied the Bible or anything at all, it might be harder for you to see God. It might be harder to have that relationship because that has to be built. And so it's important to understand how all that happens. One other passage I wanted to share with you today is from Hebrews chapter 12. He's been talking about the discipline and being able to learn from God, and he says, Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one, falls, no one fails to obtain the glory of God and that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled. And no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that afterward, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. And so here he talks very specifically about who gets to see God. And he, he, the passage is on this discipline, but he says, Strive for peace and for holiness. Without holiness... You don't get to see God. I mean, it's just pretty plain, pretty simple. It makes sense for a person who's forgiven by God to be able to realize and understand who God is. They've had their sins washed away. They're clean. They're holy. They have taken part in what God has to offer for them. And they've been set apart to be able to serve God. But a person who hasn't had that, he doesn't see it. He doesn't get it because he isn't holy. He still has his sins. He still has all those things that become blinders for him. And he goes on to say, see to it that no one fails to obtain grace. Because that's not just a thing that's passed out everywhere. I know we see that a lot and that God loves everybody and grace is to everybody. And yes, it is, but a lot of people don't see God enough to get it. And so they really don't understand what it is to have that kind of grace. And so they haven't come to the place where they understand all those things. He says, make sure that no root of bitterness causes trouble. Because sometimes people get bitter about things that have happened. Something happened in church. Somebody said something to them. Somebody did something wrong. Somebody had the wrong tie on that day or something and, and it just set them off and they would never gone back there and all those people are terrible and, and yeah there's been some real tragedies that have happened some real bad things that have happened in church and so sometimes that's what happens and they don't believe in God anymore because of what somebody did wrong in church well you realize church is a collection of sinners right so if it's the collection of sinners, maybe you shouldn't be that surprised because all of us have not been perfected yet. We're working on it, but sometimes we do say the wrong things. And sometimes we do give the wrong impression. But that's not that there's a root of bitterness that comes so that a person can no longer be part of any of that. And so sometimes he mentions specifically the sexually immoral. Points that one out. Boy, that's rampant in our day and time. They don't get to see God. Why not? Because they're focused on something else. They don't want to see God. They feel like God would judge them if they really knew what's going on. And he really does. I mean, he sees everything. We just don't see him because I don't want to see him. I don't want to see him looking at me. And so we turn our head and say, he can't see me. We stick our head in the ground and go, well, God, you can't see me. 
And so we don't want to see God in those kind of situations. And maybe it's anger. Maybe it's desire. Maybe it's when we're wronged or when we're wanted. Or, and we decide we don't want to be able to see God. And then in a very surprising thing, he mentions an unholy person. I mean, how would you feel if your name got printed in the Bible as, here is a bad person. Terry Singleton is one of the worst people in all of history. Wouldn't that be bad? And, and that's what he does here. He mentions Esau as one of the worst people in all of history. As somebody who doesn't get to see God. As an example of what unholy is. And, and so he mentions a guy who's real. He says, this is Esau. He's a guy who does not get it. And what he mentions is he sold his birthright for a single meal. And then when he wanted to get the blessing, he was rejected, so he didn't get it. He didn't treat God as holy. He didn't treat God's promises holy. And so I think that's one of those things that is very important for us to understand, is we need to be able to treat God as holy, and his promises are not cheap. And Jacob and Esau, let me just share with you a little bit about that story because it's such an amazing thing to look at that story in, in this context. He did sell his birthright for a single meal. He'd been out hunting. He's exhausted. He comes back in. His brother happens to be there stirring the stew. You know, that's what happens. Brothers are always there to be able to tempt you. And, you know, wouldn't you like some of this? Yes, I'm starving to death. Well, just sell me your birthright. Okay, that's all you need. Just sell me your birthright. Not even any money. I don't even need any cash. Just give me your birthright. And he decides, what good's my birthright if I'm dead? So he sells it to him. Now the birthright is the privilege of being firstborn. We don't have that so much anymore. But in their day and time, the privilege of being firstborn meant you took over after dad was gone. So if you have a lot of land and you're in charge of the farm, not only that, not only did you get the most inheritance, but you also got two-thirds of everything. And the rest is, you know, to little brother. We don't care about him, right? Unless you are him. <laughs> but that's what he gave up. That's what he sold. And he said, no, I don't care about being the first one. I don't care about having this birthright. This is such a dysfunctional family. Jacob actually had to trick him out of it also. As we know the story, he goes in and mom says, well, I'll cook the meat for him. And, and Esau was going to go off hunting so his dad could bless him and fix one final meal. And mom says, no, I'll, I'll fix it for you. Then you'll get the birthright and you go in and... And Esau had lots of hair on him, so they even had to put, you know, lamb's coat on, on Jacob so he could go in. He says, well, I don't think that's you. He says, yeah, that's really me. And he says, well, let me feel you. So he feels a lamb, and this guy had to be really hairy if that's what it feels like. <laughs> you got to be my, my son. You feel like a sheep. I mean, <laughs> that's a lot of hair, right? But, but he gives him the blessing then because he didn't know any better. He was blind. He couldn't see. And then when Esau comes back, well, the blessing's already been given. It's already gone. And so there's no other way. It seems like God may have had a hand in that from the Hebrews passage, but you can see how that whole thing worked out. It's, it's very bad. And so Esau decides, well, as soon as dad dies, I'm going to kill him. I'm going to kill Jacob because he can't take my blessing away and then I'll get all of it. Jacob decides, well, no, it's time to leave. And mom kind of encourages him in that and says, no, you need to leave. Go find a wife. Go to the faraway land and, and find the right kind of wife. And so that's what he's doing here, is giving him that chance to go away. And I think he runs halfway because, you know, his brother's out to kill him, but also in order to get another, to get a, a wife who is from the right tribe, from the right lineage. Because what he's doing is he's giving up the lineage of Christ. He's giving up the promise of God. 
And when you look at this, that's kind of an amazing thing. So in Genesis 28, I want you to read this with me. As he's running away, he stopped at night and he lays down to sleep. And he dreamed, and behold, there was a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your offspring. Your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread out abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And you and all your and your offspring shall all shall and in you and all your offspring shall all families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I am with you, I will keep you wherever you go, I will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. And then Jacob awoke in his sleep, and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid, and he said, How awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. What an amazing thing he did to realize that. All of a sudden, now he sees but if you think about who he is and where he came from, this is just an ordinary rock and then God speaks and God gives him the same promise again that he had given to Isaac and that he had given to Abraham. So this promise isn't anything new. He's third generation now and it's been in his family. His father and his grandfather both had this promise. I'm going to give you the land. You're going to have many descendants, stars of the heaven, dust of the earth. He says, and all families are going to be blessed in you because there's going to be one child who comes, and that child was Jesus. Jacob is just so amazed. The Lord is in this place, and I didn't know it. And when that aha happens, that you finally see God, that you finally realize where he is, that you realize he does have an input into my life, he does have control in my life, he is trying to bless me and show me something, then it's just amazing. He says, this is like the gate of heaven. This is the house of God. And that's the first time he's gotten it. How many times are we in an ordinary circumstance and we don't see God? You see, Jacob was from the family of promise, like we just said. His grandfather, Abraham, is the original man of faith. He's the beginning point. And he didn't teach his grandchildren about the promise. I'm sure he did. I'm sure it got mentioned. Or Isaac, he knows about the promise. That's why the special wife. You don't get to just marry anybody from any land like Esau did. You know, he said, well, we're getting married. I'll just pick one. He says, no, it's got to be a certain wife because it's a certain tribe. And God is trying to build a certain nation. And so you need to stay within the boundaries of what God wants. And so that's why he did it. That He knows about this promise. Why doesn't he get it? Why doesn't he see God? Why is this such a shock to him that God would even be there? He's got to have heard this promise before because they are the family of Jesus. They must have talked about it. Grandpa had defeated his enemies, their special wives, their special children. Did he know about God? Did he know about the promise? When he stole the birthright from Esau, he was stealing the promise as well. And when he got the blessing, it wasn't just the blessing for all their possessions. It was the blessing of eternal forever promise that he took from Esau. Did he know about that? It almost seems like he didn't even have a clue. And the other side is when Esau sold his birthright, he was giving away the promise of God. He had to have known about it. 
Yeah, we're going to be blessed. We're going to own all the land, all the land in the whole Middle East. It's ours. God gave it to us. Now I don't need it. You got stew? I'll, I'll trade you that for the stew. Really? I mean, that's what he's doing here. He has no respect for God or for God's promise. He didn't act like God's child of promise. And so he's not getting it. He's not understanding this. And certainly Isaac and Abraham had to have tried to teach them. I mean, these are twins, and one happened to come out just a little bit ahead of the other ones, and that's the whole reason for the birthright mix-up. Neither son seems like they really know God. How is that possible? But it happens in our families today as well, doesn't it? The preacher's kids don't know anything about God. They seem to be the least religious. The elder's kids, are there's terrors. And their grandkids are even worse. You know how it is. And the closest people to God today that sit in pews don't seem to be able to pass on the ability to see God to their children. I think that's one of the most severe indictments of us. God can be right next to us and we don't see it. It's not like it's so far away. How are we ever able to share the gospel with everybody else in the world when we haven't been able to do it with the people who are sitting right by us, who are closest to us? And maybe it's because of the, us living in a different time and we didn't know about it when we were younger and so we didn't start out our life that way. That's granted. But you realize what it means. You realize it means they didn't get it. They don't see it. They don't understand it. And now you do and it's pretty hard to teach them, isn't it? So how do we do this? How do we get where we're able to teach people about God? Because sometimes it's the people sitting in these pews that don't make it, that don't get it. I mean, they came and sat, they're supposed to, but they don't really see it. They see church as just like any other church. They don't see it as a place to meet God. So they sit in pews and they don't see God. They listen in Bible class and it's just a story about faraway people. We seem to argue about minor points, but they don't really grasp that it has any eternal significance. They should know the guy in the story. They should know what this is all about. You ever feel like it's, you're not getting the joke? I don't know if you're ever like that. I'm like that a lot of times. But they tell a joke and they're waiting for you to laugh and you're like, ha, 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 ha. <laughs> I don't know what it means yet, but <laughs> let me think about it a little bit more. I'll get it in a minute. And uh, you hate to say, I don't get it. Maybe we ought to do that more with God, but, you know, did you ever feel like your life is like that? Like you're just sitting around watching and going, okay, all these other people are getting it and I don't know what's going on here. But uh, you don't want to speak up and be embarrassed and feel like you don't get the joke, right? You can't do that. So are you just waiting for the punchline in your life? You just don't know. Or maybe there's a kid who's obsessed with baseball. I mean, everything is about baseball. So every little stick of anything becomes a bat. Pencils are bats. Every wad of paper is a ball and you have to try and shoot it at the trash can or hit it at the trash can or be able to, everything becomes that because they're so obsessed with that. And when we get so obsessed with something, we don't see anything else. Happens with video games. Maybe that's the easiest one. You see a kid with a video game and he's sitting there working on the video game. Does, does he need to eat? No, not until the third day right? Because, you know, he's just focused on that. Try and get a conversation out of him. No, he, there's no conversation going to happen. I'm playing. He's saving the world. Don't you get that? But that focus is so intense. And when that focus is so intense on things that are not God, we are not going to see him. The reason 
texting is so dangerous for people who drive is you take your eyes off the road for a second just to you know, read and be really irritated at the person who's sending you that stupid message. By the time you look up, there's a crash. It doesn't take long. Just a little bit of unfocused time. And we don't see it anymore. We don't see the crash that's happening. So I think it's extremely important for us to understand what this is all about. That we withdraw from every part of life just to do that. And we withdraw and we're not able to see God because it's not able to, he's not easy to see. Or maybe it's other things in our way. Maybe it's anger or being upset at a situation or circumstance. I don't know why I'm like this. I don't know why they're like this. I, I don't think things ought to be this way. And so we're mad and we're upset. And it's going to blind you. You're not really going to be able to see God because you don't have that peace. Or maybe it's just that you're afraid. You're afraid of everything. I'm afraid it's going to go this way, or I'm afraid it's going to go that. I'm afraid they don't like me. I'm afraid that you're still going to be blinded by that. It clouds your perception. Sometimes all we can see is the, the trash around us, and we don't really get it. We don't really understand what it's like, because that's all we get is, is the trash. It's a fog. It's, it's sin that's all there, and it's, it just doesn't let us see through it. And we go more by what we feel than by what we know to be true. We just really don't grasp it and don't understand that part. In John chapter 3, as Jesus talks to Nicodemus, he has come and asked him, basically who he is, and Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. And so he says, Those outside the kingdom just see another church. There's buildings all over. There's one three blocks down. They get confused all the time. They show up here. And so people are always coming in. Well, this church, that church, what does it matter? It's just another building. Because until you're part of it, you don't really grasp or don't really see what the kingdom of God is all about and what privileges there are in that kingdom and what those kingdom people are. And he's trying to tell Nicodemus, and Nicodemus cannot see it. He's focused on that. You have to be born again. He's like, born again? Go back into mom? I can't, we can't do, and boy, that's pretty, you know, unnerving of anything. And, you know, he's trying to figure this whole thing out. And then he talks about him. He says, no, you can't get into this kingdom unless you're born of water and spirit. We can understand it a lot better now because we have a different perspective. We understand what he means by being born again. It's not a literal physical birth, but it's a spiritual birth. That you're born of water. You're born when you're baptized into Christ because you've repented of your sins and you're born, you come up new and clean because of what God has done. Because Jesus died on a cross for us. And you're born of the Spirit because at the same time you are immersed in that Spirit. And that Spirit stays with you. And so you're born of the Spirit and you are able to have that Holy Spirit with you. And He stays with you all the time. And so with the new birth, all the sins are gone. And when you place yourself in that position, you realize that you can see God. You're able to take advantage of His blessings because it all makes sense to you now. There's lots of times where people tried to warn about different things. Lot tried to tell his son-in-laws about the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. I mean, it was going to happen that night. And it seemed like he was joking. Can you imagine Noah trying to convince people as he builds an ark? It's going to be bad. It really is going to rain. And they just can't imagine it. And so they don't get it. So what happens? How do we see God? Well, those who see God, I think, see and understand they live in a different way of life. They live in purity. 
They don't have their vision blocked by all the trash that's around them, by the frost or fog or dirt that blinds us so that all we see is world. You know, we think world is the place where we belong and world is the thing we have to deal with and that's really not true. Some people see God and some don't. And what happens is we see all the trash and we really don't grasp. But maybe what we really need to do is see who we are in God. Butterflies can't see their wings. They can't see how truly beautiful they are. But everyone else can. And sometimes people are like that as well. They don't understand how beautiful they are in Christ. They don't understand what Christ has been able to do for them. And so they don't see all the blessings that they've been able to inherit and gain. But God does. And others do. Faith is taking the first step when you can't see the whole staircase. It's a journey. It begins with being pure in heart and being holy, allowing God to make you holy because you've been born again and you allow him to wash away your sins and then you're able to see so many more things as you open up your sight to God. We see love. We see honesty. We see truth. We see trust. And we know those things exist. But to the person who's bitter, none of those things exist. So you get rid of the bitterness. You get rid of the sin that causes you not to be able to see the beauty of God. And a new birth in water and spirit opens your eyes. Do you need that today? Maybe today is the time to make a difference. It's an appeal to God for a new life, for a new insight, for a new way to see your world. Do you need to be able to see God? Would you come while we stand and sing?